Welcome to the Shadbolt Center for the Arts wood firing live stream. What you're seeing before you right now is a sped up version of the glazing process. You can see workshop participants rushing about in double time glazing. Here's some buckets of glaze. Glazes are coatings that we put on the inside of the pot suspension in water, so they need to be stirred quite regularly. See the participants glazing a bowl by pouring the glaze on the inside and then shaking it out. It's important to get the rim glazed too so that it'll be glossy. You'll notice as you're seeing the different participants glaze is that everybody has their own approach to the glazing. Some participants like to have glaze on the outside. Mostly in wood firings, there isn't much glaze on the outside. Um, but some will also do decoration, brush decoration. Uh, you can see the rainbow of different colors. The colors will change radically once they're fired. Some participants are dipping the outsides of the pots with slips which are liquid clay that have different colorants in them. See the careful brushwork that Julia is doing on the outside of the pots to have different patterning. The fire itself in this type of firing is going to decorate the outsides, but the brushwork will also add another element to it. Another tool that's commonly used is the spray gun, especially for the outside, to spray slips onto the outside. Slips are, are different colors of clay that are going to react with the fire. And a wood firing, we use what are called flashing slips because of the colorful flashing that happens from where the alkaline vapors and the ash Later. interact with the <laughs> slip. Another participant is using a slip trailer to decorate the inside of the bowl. using it to blow the wet glaze to make different patterns or even to suck the glaze out of the inside of the bowl. By turning the pot at different speeds while spraying, you can achieve different thicknesses different patterns from the distance that the sprayer is away from the pot. Some people will use water to spray the pieces too in order to again disperse the slip. In this case some wood ash is being sprinkled on top of the pot. It's important to spray it with water first so that the wood ash will actually <laughs> stick to the outside. The wood ash will melt completely during the firing leaving traces of glass dripping down the sides. You can see how different each person's pieces are even at this stage. This part of the process is called wadding. All of the pieces in the firing need to have little pieces of uh, glass resistant clay stuck to the bottom so that they won't fuse to the shelf. You'll see that these three shelves are marked for the different parts of the kiln. The front part, where that's going to get a lot of ash. Um, the middle part, which will still get quite a bit of ash, but not as much. And then the back part of the kiln, which will contain mostly glazed pieces, as it won't get as much of the ash deposit. The pots are organized by height for ease of loading. The pieces in the very front are going to end up covered in ash and will be quite gnarly looking. The ones in the middle will have some of that, but not as much. You'll notice that quite a few of the pieces have texturing on them. The texture also helps accentuate the flashing of the alkaline vapors in the kiln and the ash to deposit on the surface.
can see the train kiln. This is the kiln that the pieces are going to be loaded in and that the wood firing is going to happen in. You can see that the entry to the kiln has been unbricked and is ready to start being loaded. The loading process is quite careful because it's very important for the flames to be able to come from what you're seeing right now, the very front of the kiln, to be able to flow all the way to the back where you can see the honeycomb of bricks that draw the flames up into the chimney. Ideally, you want the flames to be in the wear chamber and not going all the way up the chimney. See, the participants are starting to slowly and carefully load the kiln. And they're stacking it in such a way that there will be a good flow of flames. It's almost like a river of fire. So you want to have a main flow of fire through the kiln, but then also many tributaries that go and flow around the pots. You'll see that the pots are at all different levels. Some pots are stacked on their sides so that ash will accumulate on the tops of them and flow down the sides in the front. Some are stacked upright so that the side of the pot on one side closest to the fire will have more of the wood ash effects. The loading process is very slow and methodical. In this type of firing, it's the fire itself that decorates the outside of these pots. So the placement of the pots is especially important. Pots are carefully measured to ensure that the top of the pot doesn't stick to the bottom of the shelf and fuse. Is this the last one? The That's ruining the pot. The yep. See the shelves being passed into the person that's actually sitting inside the kiln and stacking the shelves. Very close quarters. See great pains with keeping the shelf level so that there isn't a kiln disaster with shelves collapsing or falling over during the firing. And that's ruining the pieces. This is going to go on now. Two more, excuse me. That's too tall now, too. Pieces are carefully measured to make sure that they're going to fit before they're passed in. It's very important that the pieces don't touch each other because if they do, when the kiln is fired, they'll fuse together. In ceramics, we call this uh, a kiss. Once the front of the kiln is stacked, you move to the back of the kiln, and the back of the kiln is then stacked, all of the pieces, one at a time. You can see the person stacking the pots doesn't have a lot of space to do the stacking. Once the back of the kiln is stacked, the space in front of the door and the middle of the kiln is stacked. You'll notice that there's a gap in between the shelves where the side stoking ports are, where wood is actually thrown in. So there needs to be that space so the wood can safely land without hitting the pots. The kiln opening is bricked up to seal it in preparation for the firing. It must be completely sealed so there's no flames leaking out or air leaking in. The kiln is fully, the opening is fully bricked and ready to start. You can see Linda Doherty on starting the firing with kindling in the bottom part of the firebox where the ashes and embers need to fall. To begin with, the, can the kiln is candled. Candled means to be heated at a very low temperature to slowly dry out the pieces. If this part of the process is done too quickly, uh, the water in the pots can turn to steam and actually shatter the pots. So in the beginning, the flame is very gentle. 
just just enough to dry out the inside of the kiln and the pieces within. Once the handling process is done, the stoking of the kiln begins. You can see the firewood is thrown into the kiln. And the firebox is filled completely with wood before being sealed. You can see that the door is on rollers, so it can be quickly closed once the firebox is full. An important part of the process is the wood. A lot of wood has to be prepared before the firing. It's a mixture of softwood and hardwood. See now and again the don't the wood is stirred. Keep the fire burning evenly. Axes are used to split the wood, as well as a wood splitter, which you'll see later on in the presentation. You can see here the embers of the fire being raked. These are the pyrometric cones, which we use to tell the exact temperature within the kiln. You can see the dampers, which is the main source of oxygen for the fire. Sometimes wood is put in there. Um, mostly they're kept sealed. You'll notice that participants are wearing face shields as it gets extremely hot when they're stoking the kiln. Stoking is a very fast process because you don't want to leave the opening open for too long. The other place where wood is put in is in the side of the kiln where it's side stoked. Water is added at times in order to even out the firing temperature if it's getting too hot. Closer to the end of the firing, the firebox is bricked up. Yeah, I know. This particular <laughs> footage is taken in June. We'll soon be transitioning to the live stream portion of the presentation. So currently, Hi there. My name is Mark Kaiba. I'm doing the narration for the live stream today. R right now we're well into the firing. We're approaching, we're probably about four hours away from the end of the firing. 
The firing started yesterday at 8 a.m. and has been continuously stoked with firewood. Um, right now, the front part of the kiln is a little bit cooler, so we're working hard to try to bring up the temperature of the kiln in the very front of the kiln. Um, There's just been some firewood stoked into the firebox. Um, currently, we're at cone two in the front, and what we're shooting for is anywhere between cone 10 and cone 12. The rest of the kiln is about cone nine. So it's a pretty wide gap between those temperatures. So in a second, you'll see an image of the pyrometric cones. Because yeah. it just makes it more dynamic and you're not so bad. So you can see each yeah, no, individual that's cone yeah. that's still yeah. waiting to bend. When the cone melts, that's how we know what the temperature is. These cones are chemically formulated to melt at a precise temperature. This is the most precise way of measuring the temperature of the inside of the kiln. Uh, the other method that we use for that one, that was measuring the temperature is a digital readout using what's called a pyrometer. A pyrometer actually senses the inside temperature of the kiln, but it's not quite as precise. So it's a good rough guide, but we still rely on the old way of using the pyrometric cones.
So right now we're just waiting for the temperature to start falling. The temperature is still going up. Um, when the temperature starts falling, we'll do another stoke. Uh, during most of these firings, as you can see, there's a lot of waiting. So the classic hurry up and wait. When we're doing the stoking, of course, we're doing it really fast, rushing around furiously, and then there's a lot of kind of dead time in between to chat and talk about what's going on in the firing and troubleshoot, a lot of troubleshooting. So the, one of the main ways that we split the wood is using a wood splitter. So it's a ma machine that will split the wood for you, which is great, especially if you have really knotty wood that's stubborn to split. Also from a safety perspective, it is much safer. If you've ever seen someone not used to using an ax use one, it's uh, kind of a scary thing to see. <laughs>
to answer or should I? Yeah, just wait till you answer or on air. Should I just tell 'em? Cuz I was just joking that it was her and it was her. [inaudible 1:21:00.33] [laughs] That's so funny. Oh, we should have made four cups of coffee. Or did Starbucks? Yeah. Just like, make sure you have some water. Yeah. Yep. Some water. Yeah. Well, you can have water or mug, sure. I don't care. It'll be more cuz it's it's sugar in there. It's it's stable. Yeah. It looks like you didn't put any milk in there yet. Yeah, no, that's all fat. That's probably fat. But that's still that's still really fatty. Yeah, that's probably fat. You are correct. Yeah, it's just it's because of the sugar. I think we have too much milk and we're trying to make the breads too thin. Oh yeah. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, I might be doing this wrong then. Yeah. Mm. [laughs] Oh, it's just egg? Just like that bread is just coming out of the steamer, and then you have to stir it if you want. It's really super egg. Yeah, it's super egg. Do you think we should put any more butter in there? Pretty. Nice. Mm, yeah it's gonna steep. Mhm. I just thought of that. You guys are gonna be the first ones to try it. I know. Yeah. Where are your parents? And then we're gonna go check it out before we come over. [laughs] Yeah. Wow. Yeah, seriously. They're not making that much bread. No. They could. Mm. They just they're probably going to. Are you sure they're ready? Oh yeah. They just need like a week to like get used to it, right? You're going to be like sitting there for like two hours like eating this thing. Oh yeah, it's right. Oh, that would be so hard. Yeah. It's like trying to eat this thing here. Well, I think it's good that they're using the sauce to cook it too. Yeah, no, you're right. Because it just makes it more moist. What else are you putting in there? You got oil in there? Nope. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything. We could use oil on this. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, I'm just gonna get a pan for the eggs, probably. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I think I'm gonna do the uh, rice now. I think I wanna make the uh, this myself. Yeah, we can do that. Oh, we have butter. Yeah, we do. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's I think that's good. But I'm gonna do this. Oh, you're gonna do it? I thought you're gonna do two and two [inaudible 1:24:02.42]. I was gonna make two and two now. This is a lot of rice. Yeah, I know. Put a lot of oil on it. Don't worry, we'll add oil if we need to. Mm. I'll do a little bit more. It's a lot of oil. Don't worry. Yeah, we can add oil if we need to. Well, this is oil, so we need to be careful. What we're eating at the moment. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it's super oily. And not supposed to be super oily. Yeah. Crazy. Eat. Eat. Oh, yeah. They're using the Himalayan butter? Yeah. Yeah. Is that like the stuff you're supposed to be eating? Yeah, it's supposed to be good for you. No, it's just for people who are trying to lose weight. It has more salt. Mm, and more cardio. Mhm. But it's supposed to be healthy for you. I was trying to figure out, like, okay, what do I eat again? All these like, peanut butter things. It's like, well, I'm trying to avoid them all because they're so bad for me. Mhm. Where is my peanut butter? That's like everywhere. [laughs] Peanut butter is like everywhere. It's like, it's like you eat it, then you have it, and then you're like, I can't eat it. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much my body doesn't like peanut butter. [laughs] Really? Yeah. No wonder you gained weight. [laughs] That's probably what it is. Oh, you're talking about the weight thing? Cardio. Yeah, I've realized that lately. Mhm. Like, I start to [noise] Yeah. [laughs] Yeah, no. [laughs] Hey, we should stop doing this. Like, I was trying to get rid of it and it just wasn't working. Yeah. Yeah, totally. [laughs] Yeah. Hey, we should stop doing this. I'd like to get rid of this. I'd like to keep it like that. [laughs] Anyone else want kombucha? I'll take a little bit please. Or water. You want water in there? Oh, yeah, I'll grab some water. Okay. I didn't use my chopsticks. [noise] Oh, is that my paper towel? No I think it's mine. These rice wraps probably keep for a long time. Oh forever. Yeah. Mhm. We made them from scratch in Vietnam. Really? The rice wraps? Yeah, just like um demonstration style. Oh. They make it from scratch like the grinding the rice into flour Oh wow. It's crazy. Um How's it different from like making Ho Fun? It's exactly like Ho Fun, yeah. Yeah. Oh. When it comes out of the steamer, they like use a real fire trickle thing steamer? With like a, kinda like what do you call it? Like a mesh? Mesh thing, and you ladle it like a crepe Yeah Spread it around and then you cover it, it comes out just like That's pretty cool Ho Fun? Yeah. So these are machine-made so you can make it super thin. Oh. And then they dry them and then they? No, you don't even need to dry them. Yeah. Well we ate them like Like right away. Ho fun. Yeah Oh. It was, it was really good. So it was Ho Fun. Yeah, it, it's pretty much like Ho Fun. Pretty much, yeah. Oh. But I think like these ones yeah there's a different process to it. Oh. Cuz like Ho Fun's not as like chewy. Yeah, it's um Yeah it was like that Ho Fun consistency But it was still, it was still chewy for some reason. Phil, do you want your water? Oh yeah, I should grab that I'll fill it. Thank you. Should we pull up Ah, that's fine. I can sit on the floor. It's called Elevator? Yeah. Let's see if I remember how to explain it. Played this game many nights Yeah, in Australia. Every night almost. Wait, how long did you guys hang out with each other for? Two weeks? Probably more than that. More than that. Cuz we did Sydney too. Our East Coast trip Our East Coast trip was like two weeks Here you go. Thank you. Yeah. East Coast trip was two weeks. And then in Sydney [laughs] Perfect. Then we had two nights to Sydney too. Oh, okay. Well that's good. At least it's not like two nights in a row. Yeah. And then, yeah, so Sydney was just like, wow, this is an incredible trip. Mhm. So we decided to stay one night and just, um, make the most of it. Oh, what a, what a trip. Yeah. Like the most amount of money we spent. All our money spent on the trip. So what you say is that we should spend more time with them? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Probably. I love Sydney. I want more food. I love Sydney. [laughs] Mm. Although Sydney is so [inaudible 1:28:35.49] Yeah, I want more food. I also want more food. Well, we went to like a small town and there was no food for a while. Oh, can you help me pack my bag? Yeah, I will. I will. I'm just gonna bring it over. Thank you. Which one? Um, you know how Kenny can just grab a bag and go? I wanna grab that bag. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's me, not that one. [laughs] It's that other one. It's our other one. No, our other one wasn't packed. We have a bag full of food. No, don't worry. I'll just bring it over. Um, you know how Kenny can just grab a bag and go? I wanna grab that bag too. It's yours. It's Kenny's. It's our bag. Hopefully you can make it through. Can you pack that away? [inaudible 1:29:09.56] The last time I tried, I think I tried some of this. I was so tired. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Was it the most amount of food you've ever had in your life? [laughs] Yeah, that's probably it. [laughs] Right? I mean, that's not an exaggeration. [laughs] Yeah, I know. Like, I was all done after the first bite too. You're like [laughs] This is not enough, nearly too full. [laughs] Yeah, that's pretty much what we were saying. Oh, yeah, when we were last time in the Kootenays s- uh trip, or wherever? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's what Kenny did. Yeah, and that's what Kenny did. You guys can buy it [inaudible 1:29:19.10] for, like, twelve dollars. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of food. We actually bought it all there. Yeah, we went to a Korean restaurant and it was um with the team. Mhm. Yeah. Oh, can you help me pack this? So yeah, um I have, you know how they ship out four different kinds of food to us? Yeah. And like every time you go there it's like three different kinds of food. So we're like, "Oh, what's that? I haven't had like um like Korean food in so long. Bon appetit." I know. [laughs] It's like, "Oh, it's been a while." [laughs] Good thing we have four sandwiches. [laughs] Yeah, I know. [laughs] It's like three sandwiches. [laughs] [laughs] I always think when we go to the Korean restaurants there's always like three different kinds of meat, right? [noise] Yeah. Like, oh, what's that? Or like the seafood they're making. I had it at the Korean restaurant and it was only seven dollars. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty good. But if you go like Korean, they have um like a lot of like, they have like, if you order like the meal there's a lot of different types of meat, right? So you don't feel bad about eating raw meat. Yeah, yeah, they have like, if you order like the meat, like the seafood meal, they have like a cooked, say like, the shrimp, scallops or whatever in the bowl, so you just see it and
talk that Linda Christensen gave and she had all that and she had like the all those people playing the slot machines with the little fire signs yes, coming up yes, and yes, yes. people buying all their like compressed weird logs for their little yeah I really wanted John to have a chapter in his book just about fodder yeah, no, kill me stuff or at least a couple of little. He didn't. The only thing he mentions in the book that has to do with fathers is the guy in Australia that climbed in his kiln to save his life oh, from yeah. the wood fires. Uh, yeah, wood yeah, yeah, yeah. Wildfires. That's amazing. I was reading about that online. Wow. What are they talking about? Oh, Freddy's, Freddy's watching now. Oh, okay. She said it's scintillating. Sitting around. Are we ready? Uh, yeah. I'll get a, I'll get my drum. We're going to put a bunch of these across. At least five of them. Put five of those. Yep. Just straight walking. Straight walking. Uh, no, I think it's okay. Go for it. So we're going to put, we're going to l
So you, you can see after the stoke, after the stoke there's flames that shoot out of the chimney as well as smoke. Um, it shows that the kiln is in reduction, so reduced oxygen atmosphere, um, which is also good for bringing the heat up. So after an initial temperature drop from the stoking, the temperature of the kiln will start to rise and until it stops rising and starts falling, that will be the timing for the next stoking. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be doing an interview with two of the participants, um, Cheryl Stapleton and Nora Valiant. I'll just call them on over. Nora. Nora. <laughs> okay, so this is Cheryl Stapleton. Um, so Cheryl, what, what is it about wood firing, what, with the results of wood firing that you really like? I like the history that a pot keeps with it for forever. Um, the quiet side and the busy side, you can see which direction the flame came at it and what was not facing the flame, the drips of ash. Yeah, that's what I like is being able to turn it upside down and around and being able to tell exactly how it was positioned in that flame. Yeah, Very history. Nice. History. <laughs> it's all about the history. And uh, Nora, what is it about wood firing that you like? What keeps you coming back to the firings? Uh, community. I just like people. When I discovered wood firing, I was like, oh my God, we get to all come together and do this. It's so much fun. And you have to be here for hours and hours and hours. And you just talk and hang out and you're chopping wood and throwing it in. And it's so much fun. <laughs> And also, you know, most artists, like, you work alone in your studio. I mean, potters tend to work more together anyways. But 
there is a lot of alone time. So if at the end of the whole process, you actually get to come together and put all your pots in there together and see what everybody else made, it's so uh, exciting. And then you have the added excitement of not knowing what's going to happen in there. And you all come together and you feel all that anticipation of, oh, I wonder what, how it went in the kiln. And uh, it's, it's fun. It's really fun. Yeah. More, more Very well put. Four more sleeps. So we get to open <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a long wait, that's for sure. Yeah, it, it yeah. is a long wait. But you feel like a, you know, you feel like a little kid and your birthday yeah. is coming and you don't yeah. know what you're going to get. Yeah. Hopefully it's not, you know, a lump of coal. Yeah. <laughs> there, there will be some lumps of coal. Sure. There will yeah, be. Yeah, there's sure. a few lumps of coal. There yeah. will be. Yeah, but it's but fun. But the, the history it's of it's so interesting too because people have been doing this for, for like, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and isn't it cool we can do this it's great yeah so drawing i like that i think humans love staring at flame anyways i think fire is part of you know who we are from the beginnings of time it's fire and yeah we love fire we're pyromaniacs and, and gathering around it and gathering around the fire and yeah hopefully one day having pizza parties again and stuff yeah. like that at the end yeah yeah. yeah, flames. That, okay. That's one aspect of COVID, of course, that has, you know, put an end to our pizza parties. We also have here at the Shad Volta an amazing wood-fired pizza oven. Um, and so it's been cold for far too long. So we're hoping sometime in the near future to be able to make pizza together and share food. I mean, it's another huge thing that we always do at these firings, too, is sharing food um, as well as company and fire, yeah. which, as you guys said, goes back to the, the dawn of time, hey? Yeah. And the community, yeah, the community and, and the dawn of time, yeah. The yeah. other thing, though, is <laughs> it's really neat to get to see other people's work and what they've been working on and then talk to them about, oh, like, oh, why'd you do it this way? Or what glazes are you using? Or you get to what share clay? ideas. Yeah, what clay did you use? Or? Yeah, so there's a lot of information yeah. exchange. And um, so shop it's shop talk. <laughs> and it's... And because it's right there in front of you and you're involved for so many hours, there's a lot of time to reflect and um, think about what you want to do the next time you go into the studio and start the making cycle again. So that's really nice, too. So, thank you. No, thank you very thank much. You. No, thank you. Thank you. Short history of wood firing at the Shadbolt Center for the Arts. For 20 years, potters at the Shadbolt Center for the Arts have had the great joy and remarkable experience of firing their work in two different kilns fueled by wood, the Ombu kiln and the train kiln. This rare opportunity is unique in the Lower Mainland and has attracted students, professionals, and visiting artists from around the province, across the country, and all over the world. How it began. In 2000, the City of Burnaby approved the building of a two-chambered wood kiln on the grounds of the Arts Centre as a Millennium Project. Shadbolt Ceramics teacher and technician, Linda Doherty, in collaboration with Arts Administrator, Sharon Ray, spearheaded the proposal. Master potter and kiln builder, Mazakazu Kuzakabe, came from Japan to build our first wood kiln. He named it Ombu, which means on my mother's back since one chamber rested or piggybacked against the other. He specially designed the kiln to be smokeless, as stipulated by city regulations, and to have one chamber in which salt or soda could be introduced for added effects on the pots. As Linda wrote in her article, which appeared in the 2015 edition of the Logbook magazine, with no options for firing with wood in the area, the ceramics department convinced the city that if we built a wood fire kiln, we would attract interest in firing from schools, colleges, and pottery guilds, as well as guest firers from around the world. 
The craze for wood firing spread like wildfire over the ensuing years as more and more potters in our area became obsessed with this exciting and communal method of firing. Many new pyromaniacs were trained drawing from near and far. High school, college, and university students from all over Vancouver, local pottery guilds, and individual potters from across the province. The Ombu Kiln also raised the international profile of the Art Centre, attracting world-famous ceramic artists to lead the firing workshops. Guest firers from Australia, Janet Mansfield, Robert Barron, Paul Davis, and Gail Nichols, the United States, Jack Troy, Linda Christensen, Mark Hewitt, and John Neely, and Canadians Gordon Hutchins and Martin Tegseth taught us their own unique methods of firing sharing tips and fostering connections between our communities of makers around the globe. Wood firing workshops also became a much anticipated activity associated with the Canadian Clay Symposium, an educational celebration of all things ceramic hosted by the Shadbolt every three years. Wood firing, an ancient technology and its renaissance. The history of firing ceramics to very high temperatures upward of 1300 degrees Celsius using only wood as fuel traces its origin to 5th century Korea, China, and Japan. The first high temperature fired kilns were tunnel kilns built into hillsides, called anagama or cave kilns. The distinctive shape of these kilns and their specific location climbing up a slope work together to allow high temperatures to be reached over the course of several days or multiple weeks of continual stoking of fuel. The process created unique results, not only the vitrification of stoneware and porcelain clays, but the formation of natural ash glazes. Eventually, potters built sagers to protect the glazed surfaces from flying ash and soon developed a variety of colors, including the much prized celadons thus opening up a range of aesthetic explorations. These were exciting times in the history of ceramics, when it became possible to make objects that were stronger and could last longer than the commonly used earthenwares. Pots made from earthenware or low-fire clays were similar to our basic flower pots. They seeped water and broke easily. The discovery of how to achieve extremely high temperatures hot enough to create colorful, glassy, high-gloss surfaces, was a significant technological achievement and, as such, became a secret guarded for centuries by potters, kiln builders, and fire masters in Asia. A renaissance of interest in learning how to build and fire wood kilns took off across North America, beginning slowly in the 1970s. By the mid-1990s, this renewed interest really caught fire. Kilns began to pop up in various communities, communities being a key word, because these large beasts are hungry dragons that can't easily be fired alone. Wood kilns require a group of people working together to fire them. It's a lot of hard work, but it is also a lot of fun. Life of a kiln, challenges and changes. Each firing of the Ambu kiln at the Shadbolt took approximately 35 hours, consumed two to three cords of wood, and required a team of 10 people, students and staff, to complete. Participants brought pots to glaze with specially formed slips and glazes before spending an afternoon loading them into the kiln, and then spent six-hour shifts stoking wood into the kiln every 20 minutes or so, until it reached an internal temperature of 1300 degrees Celsius. It took two days to cool before unloading the pots. When they are taken from the kiln, the surface of the pots have been decorated by the movement of the flame and melted wood ash to reveal subtle flashing and earthy hues of green to rich browns and tawny orange tones. As Linda describes it, some of the firings were more eventful than others. Upon opening the kiln after the second firing of the Ombu kiln, onlookers discovered the shelves had collapsed in a domino effect. Luckily, most of the pots were saved. A few firings later, the shake shingle roof caught fire at the end of the firing, but thanks to some quick thinking by the firemaster, we managed to extinguish it very quickly. Firings were put on hold while an expensive three-layer heavy metal casing was built around the chimney to protect the wooden roof. In 2009, wear and tear on the kiln prompted a return visit by Mazakazu Kusakabe from Japan. 
He completed repairs and maintenance on the kiln, embellishing the exterior walls with fanciful figures and spinning whorls before leading a firing workshop with student participants. All in all, the ombu was fired more than 70 times over a period of 13 years. As is the case with every wood kiln, its life is limited. Firings take a toll, flues collapse, bag walls buckle, exterior insulation falls off, and interior floors build up layers of melted glass created by liquefied wood ash. A new kiln was needed to replace the beloved ombu, which was fired for the last time in March 2014 and demolished soon afterward. The train kiln, our second wood kiln. What's a train kiln? The idea of a train kiln was developed by John Neely, an American potter and professor of ceramics, who came to give a presentation at our 2013 Canadian Clay Symposium. He suggested that a train kiln would be the ideal replacement for the aged ombu kiln. A train kiln is a contemporary style of wood-burning kiln evolved from the ancient design of an anagama tunnel kiln. The firings achieve similar effects on the pots. However, a train kiln is easier to build and fire and is more environmentally friendly. Less wood is consumed and, like the ombu, it produces very little smoke from the chimney. The perfect match for our requirements and unique location. Master kiln builder Ted Neal from the United States was invited to design and build our train kiln. A kiln building workshop was held with students and Shadbolt staff, Linda Doherty and Jay McLennan, working alongside Neal and his assistant. The new kiln was fired for the first time in July 2014 with spectacular results. Since then, the train has been fired on average four times a year. We hope you enjoy being part of this firing.
it's a pre- So the front of the wear chamber is a little bit cool still. We're trying to bring the temperature up there. Um, so we're actually going to start doing what's called side stoking. So we have a little tiny hole in the side of the kiln where we can access uh, the gap between the shelves. And we can add wood in between the shelves to try and bring up the temperature in that front part of the kiln. So you'll see wood is added. And hopefully that will bring up the temperature. I had a whole conversation with it.
Gail Carney had this trick that she told us about. Said that uh, in the, in, like the big industrial kilns, what the, the kiln people would do is at the, near the end of the firing, they'd just get a long metal rod and they'd just push the cone down. Great technique. Did Gail ever tell you about that one? I to do Gail's voice, but you know, I just couldn't go there. You can share out with you, Gail. Tell her the story and she'll Oh, yeah, I bet she could, too. And you still hear it. Very distinct.
Yeah, I saw the rate you paid. You fired down. You know? Get those really good attacks. Every time it just sets us behind.
much I've been in time for him. Yeah, I've been there before. better
better side of this side of the mask without my pin on here. My pin is made of it. Do you want to switch sides? No, this is my better side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, once again, I'm interviewing Nora Valiant. So Nora, what are some of your favorite things about the Shadbolt Center? Uh, well, I've been coming here for so many years. Uh, first firing the wood kiln and, um, and then was part of, I've been a part of the Canadian Clay Symposium which happens here every three years, and it's fantastic. We have potters who come from all over the province, all over Canada, special uh, workshops. presenters, workshops, um, and it's, it's really great, and it's been really a wonderful experience helping to organize that over the years. And then I've been teaching here for maybe about five years. I love it. It's, um, it's such a great facility. Um, we have nice, spacious classrooms, which as a teacher is just fantastic. Um, and it's really well organized, which I really appreciate <laughs> because there's a lot going on here. So they have to stay organized. So we've got the wood kiln firings and that happens about four times a year. And then uh, the soda kiln that's here. We've got the gas kiln for our classes, which is great because people are firing at cone 10. Um, but we've also got raku, pit firings, every kind of thing you can imagine. So it's super diverse, and uh, that's really special. Um, One-stop shopping for all your firing needs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention is um, had to do with... Now I forgot what it was. Oh, dear. Um, I'm sure it was quite profound. It, I'm sure. Ask me another question. So, of all of these different firing techniques, what is your favorite firing technique? Wood! <laughs> totally wood! I really love wood firing. Um, so that is really special because it's hard, you know, it's not something that's easily taken on by just a potter by themselves on their own place, you know. It is a communal thing like we were talking about before and there's a lot of infrastructure involved and I think that um, the way the way everybody can come together and work and share the resources and have an upkeep of the facility and upkeep of all the, not just the kilns, but all the tools that we use and all the glaze materials and every, everybody's on top of it. So it helps things run really well and work smoothly and that's really good. And, and it does give it a really big kind of family feel too, I find. Yes. Like, yes, you know, after, you know, having the, the lockdown and the pandemic and then coming back here to do our first firing, exactly. it, it really felt like kind of seeing old friends and family again. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's just been really nice to work together once again. Yes. And I remember what that thing was. What I was going to say is, you know, when I teach my intro classes, they're like an eight week long session, but that doesn't always work for everybody. You know, everybody has different work schedules and different demands in their everyday life, but you can come here and just take a workshop that just lasts a weekend, or you could come and do an intensive, like a week long uh, extruding class with Linda Doherty or something like that, and just take that week and go intensive. Or you could just come do a raku firing, midnight raku. That's so fun. So anyway, there's a it's um, that kind of uh, variety of different offerings. Like it just works for different people, you know, to make it fit into their schedule. And we have this amazing residency program in August. That's the full month of August, and um, that's just a really special thing to have. So yeah. Speaking of special, I think we, we might be preparing to do a stoke. Yeah. Shall we go burn some wood? Yeah, absolutely. Fire time.
there not is there not those beats on there? I think there's just stuff like that. But if you start uh the next part? Just the two right words. done the soda a few times.
So, so we're going to sh- So the idea is to show show the cones, right? Like the inside of the kiln. Do you want me to stand over here? Do you want do you want a, do you want a cone pack to show them? Um So we're about to wrap the live stream portion. Um, Right now we're just looking at the cones. The back of the kiln is at cone 11, which is very hot. It's close to 1300 degrees Celsius. We're still trying to get the the front temperature up. We've got probably another two or three hours of of, uh, firing time left. Um, So you can see right now the cone pack and how extremely hot it is inside the kiln. At this point, at that temperature, the ash in the kiln is actually melting on the surface of the pots and forming a beautiful glassy layer. Um, So as potters, of course, that's exactly what we're looking for. And so it makes us very excited. Um, We're going going to uh, wrap up the uh, segment with some footage from June, of wood firing that we did in June. I'm showing the unloading of the kiln. So unbricking the door and then showing the unloading of the kiln so you can get a sense of what this will look like. We're not going to unload this kiln until next Wednesday. Um, so it's always tough to wait that whole time. Um, but uh, that's part of the excitement. So thank you very much for joining us. You can see after the firing, all of the melted ash trickling down. So here's the unbreaking of the kiln, speed it up. Of course, it takes much longer, but you always get little glimpses of the pots inside. And it's always heavy anticipation and excitement as you see little glimpses of the pieces. So this is the kiln cam. You can see how uh, the kiln is being unloaded. Extra fast piece, little wads left behind. Oh, it's all good. Play yeah. The pieces are fired on. Does he do? The excitement no. of Julia's no. face is no. she's handing no. it to the piece. So usually we have kind of a chain of people who are coming and oh, taking cool. each piece. The cool thing is that each participant in the firing will handle all of the pieces in the firing. So there's always a lot of excitement. People uh, exclaiming at each other's pots and, you know, really being inspired, of course, by, by the results that everybody has gotten. Um, the exciting course is grinding the shelves so the glass residue on the shelf from the melted ash and alkaline vapor. So you can see we use these heavy abrasive um, scourers to scour off the shelves. Again, it's all part of the teamwork. You know, everybody lending a hand to do the labor to maintain the, the equipment and the shelves. Um, it is very dusty, so people are wearing masks. and takes a lot of elbow grease.
They're literally like shards of glass flying off as they're grinding the shelves. Once the shelves have been ground off, the next step is washing them with kiln wash to prepare them for the next firing. You can see the, the back of the kiln being unloaded here. If only it goes that fast. This is a great view because it shows you the, the stack of pots after they've been fired. See people scrutinizing the, the pieces. And it really is a thing of beauty when you see the, all of the pots all laid out together. We've got some great detail shots here of some of the, the effects of the ash trickling down on the inside of the pieces. The, the surfaces are incredibly varied. And the thing to remember is the outside of the pots are completely decorated by the flame itself. So the ash deposition, as well as those al alkaline vapors. You'll notice this is the front part of the kiln. The colors are more muted because they have way more ash deposited on them. Um, the back side of those pieces is usually uh, a very flashy kind of orange color, whereas the front side is gray and kind of ashen looking. As you can see, there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen too. You can see the inside of the kiln being chiseled as literally there are pieces of glass fused to the surface. You see all the ash that's coming down the steps that go into the front of the kiln. So it really shows the amount of labor that goes into the whole process, and it really is a labor of love. It's a very rewarding process to be involved in, and I'd like to, at this point, thank the Shadbolt Center for everything they do for the local ceramics community. Uh, it means a lot to everyone. It's always impressive to see the array of colors that come out of it. A lot of kind of earth tones and fiery orange and red colors, but also some very vivid blues and purples, iron reds. At the end of a firing, people are always busily packing up their pieces, but also going admiring each other's pieces and often trading individual pieces as well with each other. It, uh, it really is a great community experience where the participants have a lot of respect for each other and you know, are frankly quite inspired by the work that each other are doing. So it's type of uh, experience that can't really happen by yourself.